Hi, everyone, and welcome to my presentation on what is an anonymity enhanced cryptocurrency here at Coordination of Decentralized Finance 2021. I'm here to talk about some of the recent definitions put forward by Department of Justice and FinCEN attempting to define an anonymity enhanced cryptocurrency to classify coins against that definition, and also some of the implications of anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies on the ability of law enforcement uh, to fulfill their role uh, within the space. And so um, I think that this is an area that is poorly understood uh, by uh, a lot of uh, participants in the industry and in particular law enforcement. And so it is certainly worthwhile uh, kind of exploring the definitions and, and assertions that have been put forward so far in greater detail. I am Ryan Taylor. I'm the CEO of Dash Core Group. Dash Core Group is one of many legal entities that serve the Dash network in various capacities. Uh, Dash Core Group is a particular important uh, entity to the network because it is responsible for developing the protocol itself, uh, as well as doing business development, marketing, legal work, and other important work on behalf of the network. As way of introduction, uh, the US Department of Justice cryptocurrency uh, enforcement framework and FinCEN's notice of proposed rulemaking described or defined anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies over the last couple of years. And they also asserted that they are money laundering risks or at risk of, uh, or elevated risk of illicit use. The stated reason for categorizing anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies is that they inhibit investigators' ability to both identify transaction activity involving blockchain data and to attribute that illicit activity to people. Um, and while we uh, certainly laud the US government's efforts to investigate and prosecute illicit actors, we believe that the definition of anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies is simply too vague, it's woefully inadequate, and in some instances, it is wrongfully categorizing assets as anonymity enhanced. And so uh, throughout the presentation here, you'll uh, hear us focusing on the definitions and on the actual technologies behind anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies. The first issue is there isn't a clear and consistent definition of anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies by US regulators. Back in 2019, uh, FinCEN uh, introduced some guidance on anonymity enhanced uh, transactions and said that those are transactions that either are denominated in regular cryptocurrency, but structured to conceal information that would not otherwise be distributed through the public ledger, or transactions that are denominated in cryptocurrencies that are specifically engineered for the purpose of preventing their tracing through distributed public ledgers, also called privacy coins. Now, the issue with this definition is twofold. One is that uh, it depends on the intent of the engineer. As one example, there are privacy enhancing features that can be built on blockchains that have multiple benefits, one of which may be privacy. But other benefits may include it reduces the transaction size, um, thereby reducing fees on the network and making the blockchain more efficient. And so by depending on a definition that depends on the intent of the engineer, you can't say whether that engineer was building that feature for the purpose of enhancing privacy slightly, or for uh, improving efficiency of the blockchain. The second issue with it is that it doesn't define what uh, enhancements need to take place specifically to a transaction to say that it is concealing information. Uh, there are a lot of complexities in some of these transaction types, including off-chain transactions, 
Um, and almost all uh, digital currencies rely on a public ledger. And so their native distributed public ledger often supports privacy natively. And so you're mixing together basically in this definition, different concepts that simply uh, don't create a, a clarity for the engineer itself that, that is designing these systems. The second issue is uh, with Department of Justice's cryptocurrency enforcement framework definition, where they said uh, crypto, some cryptocurrencies use non-public or private blockchains that make it more difficult to trace or attribute transactions. These are referred to as anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies or privacy coins. So according to this definition, a privacy coin is one that has a private blockchain. The issue is that almost all blockchains have public uh, public blockchains, including Monero, Zcash, and Dash, that they uh, actually included as examples of non-public blockchains. In the case of all of these blockchains, the blockchain itself is public and can be analyzed using analytics software from uh, Chainalysis or from CypherTrace. CypherTrace has a tool that's available to law enforcement for analyzing Monero transactions. Uh, and uh, Chainalysis has uh, tools available for Zcash and Dash. And in fact, Chainalysis said that Dash transactions are no different functionally than Bitcoins, making the analysis functionally identical. Uh, they also said that Dash being called a privacy coin is a misnomer. And so, it's very clear that the definition itself is flawed in this instance, and that the examples being given specifically do not align with the definitions being presented to the industry. The other issue and the bigger issue is that privacy is non-binary. This is an attempt to label coins as either privacy or non-privacy. And that thinking is flawed in and of itself. And the reason is because this really is a continuum. And it's not even a continuum along uh, different, uh, a, a single spectrum. There are multiple spectrums to which privacy can be applied. Privacy can apply to who's receiving the coins, who's sending the coins, what your balances are, uh, whether or not a third party can observe uh, transaction amounts whether or not the receiver can view information further back in your transaction history, like where the coins came from for you. In the case of Zcash, as an example, the exchange can be provided with a view key that allows them to see additional information about transaction history, but not third parties observing the blockchain. And so it is an oversimplification to try to categorize coins in such a binary way. And it really leaves a lot of gaps and issues in that definition. Some techniques for enhancing privacy on public blockchains include off-chain transactions. Simply don't do the transactions on the blockchain. Um, there are a number of technologies that allow for off-chain transactions or side-chain transactions. Uh, destroy and redeem model. This is where coins are actually destroyed and the person who destroys them can redeem them in a new address. And that completely destroys any linkage between the new coins and the old coins. Shielding addresses or amounts so that third parties cannot observe those on the blockchain. Uh, Mimblewimble. This is a technology that is a side chain and essentially lumps a bunch of transactions together and makes them harder to trace or track. Tumbling or mixers, mixing services. These are services that will accept coins from you and give you new fresh coins to a fresh address in your own wallet. And lastly, coin join or shuffling. This is a movement of funds from one set of addresses in your wallet to a new set of addresses in your wallet, making it unclear uh, you know, whether those addresses were a movement of funds to someone else's wallet or a movement of funds to your own. And so it's just a, a mechanism for complicating your transaction history and obscuring 
the balances to people that you transact with. So there are certain blockchains like Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Dash that are fully transparent by default. Any observer can follow every single transaction, including the inputs, outputs, amounts, and addresses of the or all the way back to the origin of the blockchain or the Genesis block. The primary privacy features, though not the only one on these blockchains, is non-custodial coin join. This is widely implemented on most blockchains. Private send, uh, which is Dash's implementation, is simply a branded implementation of non-custodial coin join. We'll see other examples on other blockchains in a moment. Then there are opaque blockchains, which shield some type of information about transactions, like the, the uh, uh, addresses or amounts, uh, or they combine transactions in, in a me mechanism called Mimblewimble, Berman, burn and redeem model. What this means is that you can't actually look back and follow every single transaction back to the origin of the blockchain. Uh, and, and therefore, it makes it you know, very difficult, if not in some cases impossible, to trace back using existing technologies. And here's some examples of blockchains that use some of these features. Monero and Zcash, you've probably heard of, but there are many, many others. So what does non-custodial coin join look like? There are differences across networks, uh, but you know, generally speaking, coin join transactions are simple to identify and to trace. Uh, they basically, it's the movement of funds between different uh, wallet uh, addresses within the user's wallet. This is different from tumblers or mixers. These are usually third party services that accept incoming coin from you and redistribute uh, new coins to you. Um, and as such, they are operating as money services business. Um, and so coin join transactions, as I said, they're simple to identify. And the same techniques are used to analyze coin join transactions across all of these networks, whether it's Bitcoin, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, or Dash. Any transparent blockchain can be analyzed uh, if they are simply using CoinJoin. Here is the steps of the CoinJoin implementation on Dash's network. Uh, there are three stages to uh, transacting using private send. In the first step, the user denominates their, uh, the funds in their wallet into specific denominations. In this case, uh, one Dash, point one Dash, and 0 0.01 dash. In stage two, those funds are sent from one address in the user's wallet to another address in the user's wallet. The thing that makes them more complicated though is that they are combining into a single transaction with other users uh, to make that movement of funds. And all users that are party to that transaction all sign that same transaction and broadcast it to the network. Uh, and so the result is that there is some uncertainty over which of the addresses on the right uh, the first user uh, now, now has. And so uh, the, the exact linkage, it becomes uncertain, though not untraceable. Mind you, at this stage, no funds are being sent anywhere or uh, sent from the user to anyone else. In stage three, there is an actual spend event. And at this time, I will, uh, as a user, my wallet will select inputs to use that amount to the amount that I want to send. In this case, it's 2.21 dash. And I will select from my available coins the ones that uh, I need to send in order to send that exact amount. Uh, and so those are the three stages. So let's walk through an example of a private send coin join. What you see here is a set of inputs and outputs to a transaction. The link to this transaction can be found on the slide. And on the left, there are 20 inputs labeled 0 through 19, and on the right, 20 outputs. 
you can see that a denominant amount of approximately 0.01 is sent from each of the addresses on the left to each of the addresses on the right. You will also notice that the addresses are all unique. And so uh, in this case, you can see that uh, this is simply the movement of funds from one set of addresses to another. There are three participants to this transaction and it's unclear which of the addresses on the right belong to which of those three participants on the left. And so it introduces complexity into blockchain analytics and it does make it more difficult to uh, definitively attribute a uh, amount on the right to users on the left. But you can narrow it down to a set of users that were participants to the transaction on the left and therefore deterministically uh, you can analyze these transactions using sophisticated software and attribute transactions back to their origin in many cases. Uh, the interesting thing about this transaction is it isn't actually a private send. This is done on Bitcoin's uh, network. We did this coin join on Bitcoin. And you can see that the amounts there are actually in, denominated in BTC and that the addresses are Bitcoin's uh, address format. This is that same transaction done on Dash's network. And you can see an example here of another transaction using the exact same amounts, uh, shifting funds from a set of 20 addresses to a new set of 20 addresses. Functionally, these are identical. If I flip back and forth between these two slides, you can see that the only differences are the currency being used and the currency uh, address format. And so there really is no difference between uh, or changes needed to Bitcoin's protocol in order to do these transactions. It does not rely in any way on obscuring information. It simply uh, com introduces complexity that can be uh, introduced to any transparent blockchain. So Dash is an example, uh, private send is an example of actually a low privacy method. Um, there are many attributes to a private send transaction, but let's go through some of them. First, it involves no transmission of any funds to any intermediary. In fact, all I'm doing in a private send is sending uh, Dash from one address in my wallet to another. And until spent, those funds are not out of my control. It requires absolutely no modification to the Bitcoin protocol in order to conduct these transactions. They are non-custodial uh, and decentralized implementation of CoinJoin. Uh, there is, uh, these are optional, they're user initiated and they're only used about 0.38% of the time. You can easily detect them because of their standardized nature. You can spot them very easily on the blockchain and it doesn't conceal any information. It doesn't rely on obfuscation of data. All that data is stored on the public ledger of every movement of funds that are conducted. And what I would describe this as good enough for user safety purposes. I can safely transact with uh, uh, a business or I can safely transact with uh, someone that is that I'm buying something from off of Craigslist and I don't have to worry that they're going to be able to easily identify my wallet balance and therefore you know have their friends come after me with a baseball bat <laughs> or kidnap my my children what what it does is it keeps non-sophisticated actors like that from being able to easily attribute funds stored on the blockchain to my real world identity when I transact with them. What it does not do is it doesn't prevent sophisticated actors like exchanges from leveraging uh, blockchain analytics in order to uh, analyze transactions, risk score them, and appropriately deal with high risk situations. It's also true that cryptocurrencies don't stay the same over time. And much of this was acknowledged in the FinCEN uh, proposed rulemaking, but uh, cryptocurrencies can't really be quote approved 
or non-AEC and stay that way. Cryptocurrencies have changed to increase privacy levels that aren't considered anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies by regulators. So Litecoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, these are much larger networks yet were not called out as being anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies in any of the documentation from the government. Yet Litecoin, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash have implemented all of these things that are not present in Dash's implementation of CoinJoin. Uh, and we'll go through some of these in a moment. So what are some of these enhancements? So first of all, the zero link protocol is widely implemented. That implements something called Chamian CoinJoin that actually blinds the coordinating server from seeing any of the information that it is helping to coordinate. BIP47 payment codes, also known as stealth addresses, not supported in, in Dash. Uh, they combine mixing and payment into a single step, which makes the transfer of funds uh, falsely to appear to, to be as a mixing transaction and not an actual spend. Uh, they have implemented Boltzmann clustering resistance. This isn't technically a coin join, but what it does is make a regular transaction appear to be a coin join. And by doing that, I create some plausible deniability over the link between two addresses uh, that I sent to and received funds from. There's also uh, PayNim, which uh, ensures that payment addresses aren't revealed to anyone except for the sender until the sender is ready to spend them. Uh, transaction hopping, this adds additional transactions between the sender and receiver to make it so that an exchange on the receiving end would only look so far back in the blockchain before determining that something is not high risk. Uh, batch spending, this combines multiple transactions into a single transaction uh, and um, thereby complicating the transactions further. Now, all of this technical jargon is likely uh, over a lot of people's level of understanding of the tech itself. And it's not so important to understand the details of the technology as it is to compare various blockchains on these attributes. And when we do that comparison, Dash has absolutely no privacy features that haven't already been adopted by Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash all of which were not identified as anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies. And yet Bitcoin, Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash all have implemented privacy enhancing techniques in one or more of their wallets that have never been implemented within Dash's ecosystem. And so it is very difficult for us to reconcile why Dash is being singled out as an anonymity enhanced cryptocurrency while these other networks are not. Um, in the case of Monero and Zcash, a lot of these features are not needed because they do have shielding of transactions and that does obscure amounts uh, to analytics uh, capabilities. And so there's a big difference between each of these in terms of, of the features that they support but it's very clear they're not completely equal and it's really unclear to us why Dash is consistently identified as an anonymity enhanced cryptocurrency when it lacks many of these features. And so the definitions themselves are clearly not being applied in an objective way. The other assertion is that Dash is, or, or uh, anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies are widely used on the dark net and present an elevated risk of money laundering. The data doesn't suggest that that statement is true. This is an analysis from RAND Europe uh, done last year. And they looked at dark web cryptocurrency usage and the distribution of identified cryptocurrency wallets on the darknet. And what they found is that despite Bitcoin having 60 to 65% of the market cap of the cryptocurrency space, it accounted for 90 to 95% of the transact of the usage on the dark net. And so when we compare that with other cryptocurrencies that are supposedly anonymity enhanced, like Monero, Zcash, and Dash, 
they simply are not widely used. And uh, there's, there's little evidence uh, to suggest that, that, they, that they are widely used. And you can even adjust for market cap. Uh, in the case of Dash, if you adjust for Dash's smaller market cap, it is still used 70% less often than Bitcoin on the darknet. And so the assertion that uh, Dash, Zcash, Monero, and other anonymity-enhanced cryptocurrencies are what is driving a lot of the illicit use is contradicted by actual facts and research being conducted within the industry. We feel that rather than trying to define what an anonymity enhanced cryptocurrency is, we should also be defining what is a non-anonymity enhanced cryptocurrency. And we would define that as a cryptocurrency built upon a transparent blockchain where anyone is able to trace all inputs, outputs, dates, and transaction amounts back to the Genesis block. Even with this definition, there are complications. In the case of Bitcoin's Lightning Network, where transactions can occur off blockchain, the settlement transactions themselves do occur on the main blockchain. But even nodes within the Lightning Network that are coordinating the transactions themselves cannot see the origin of funds nor the destination of funds in that uh, transaction. And so even within this definition, there are complicating factors that make, uh, make this extremely difficult to nail down in a binary way. One of the most frustrating aspects for engineers within the space is the lack of concrete definitions around anonymity enhancements and the attempt to label them in a binary way. When I read the 2019 guidance from FinCEN, I read it many times and concluded there is absolutely no way that Dash would be considered an anonymity enhanced cryptocurrency under these definitions. Every input, output, amount, uh, addresses involved are completely transparent on our blockchain. And therefore, there is no obfuscation of any information that would normally be available on the blockchain and nothing barring any third party from analyzing those transactions and appropriately risk scoring them, uh, analyzing uh, their transaction history and attributing them uh, to an origin or a potential set of origins that they could have come from in a way that would allow for mis risk mitigation, uh, especially with anyone that you're transacting with on, on, on multiple occasions. Um, and I also read the definition and thought that Bitcoin may have an issue because it supports off-chain transactions that don't record any of that information on their blockchain. If a professional in the industry can read a definition and come to a very different conclusion than what regulators are coming to, the definition itself is bad. And I'm not the only one having this issue. Uh, Chainalysis has come out and stated that Dash is being labeled a privacy coin is a misnomer. Chainalysis is a trusted partner of the Department of Justice and FinCEN in fighting crime on these issues. And they're telling the public that Dash should not be labeled an anonymity enhanced cryptocurrency. And so when experts within the industry are all disagreeing with the definitions being put forward, the inadequacy of the definitions and the application of those definitions, we have a major issue that needs to be dealt with. And we propose that, that there needs to be a lot more effort put into this if these are going to be implied. We also feel that what's more important than coming to a definition is ensuring that the exchanges and other money services business have the ability to deal with a particular blockchain's privacy features because they are not uh, static over time. They need to have a series of processes 
uh, identification of the people that they're dealing with or transacting with, uh, and amounts and blockchain analytics and that combination of things needs to be appropriate to mitigate risks. And that could come in any combination. It is not strictly the technology itself, but it is these processes and techniques uh, that the exchanges have available to them and tools and other things that they have available to them that they can apply to mitigate risk and report risk when it is appropriate. And so we think that there needs to be much more focus on that rather than on defining the level of privacy. And so with that, I'll close. I think that there's a lot more discussion that we can have on this and I look forward to some of the panels and presentations that, that we have throughout the, the conference on this topic. Thank you.